Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you and be with you this morning. Um, first, I come with some bad news. Um, Brad McKinstry, for those of you who don't know, died um, the, on Friday night, um, in kind of in the middle of the night. Uh, I would encourage you to pray for and um, just give Marlis some extra love this week. Um, uh, funeral preparations are being made. I believe the service is going to be next Saturday at 1 o'clock at, at IFC um, from 1 to 2. And then I think there's going to be a luncheon there at IFC as well. Um, a couple of other things for you this morning. Um, next, for the next two weeks, uh, kind of our summer of, uh, of different service places and times we're finishing it with a bang. Um, so next week we're gonna be outside at the picnic shelter by the fire hall at 9.30. And then the week after that, we'll be across the street for our last joint service of the summer at also at 9.30. So we're at 9.30 the next two weeks. Um, one other piece of, um, of good and bad news, our piano player, Kathy Dale, um, her tire, literally fell off of her car this morning. She is okay, that's the good news. She is just fine, um, but she called about 10 minutes ago saying she wasn't gonna make it. Um, so we're gonna have some recorded piano music and we've changed all the hymns and we're gonna figure this out as we go. Um, it's gonna be a great service. Uh, the, t the tires are falling off, but we're gonna, we're gonna make it through. Um, I know there's a couple, oh yes. Uh, Wendy, you got a CYF thing for us? <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Wendy and Diana. So that's uh, this Wednesday, 6 o'clock. You don't have to have a youth. You can, uh, if you'd like to come and have a hamburger or a hot dog, um, feel free to come and join us. Um, and there'll be some games and time for hanging out and fellowship after as well. And then Thursday, 5.30 Bible study. Yeah. Yeah, and that could be you. That could be you to help with your yard work. Thanks, Debbie. Any other announcements this morning? All right, let us rise and worship God together. We're going to join in singing, Come Now is the Time to Worship. Now 
is a time to worship. Come, now is a time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. Come. Amen. You all carry that really well. Nice to see that. <sighs> Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sins, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for these waters of baptism, for the new life that they bring, for the worship that we are able to do in and through them. Help us, O God, oh God, to worship you today in the spirit of these waters and in the spirit of truth and love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Together let us confess our sins and come to God for healing. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have honored you with our lips, but have harmed our neighbors with our tongues. The cravings at war within us cause conflicts and disputes. In our desire to be first, we make distinctions among ourselves. We place the needs of the poor and the suffering last. In your great mercy, forgive us our sins. Draw near to us with grace in time of need, and turn us to follow in the way of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. People of God, hear the good news. God promises to forgive our iniquity and to remember our sin no more. By grace, we have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, the sign and source of eternal healing, you are forgiven, freed, and loved. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all. Let us pray. O oh God, our strength, without you we are weak and wayward creatures. Protect us from all dangers that attack us from the outside and cleanse us from all evil that arises within ourselves, that we may be preserved through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you all. Please share with one another a sign of the peace of Christ. Good morning. The first reading is from Deuteronomy 
chapter 4, verses 1 through 2, and verses 6 through 9. So now, Israel, give heed to the statutes and ordinances that I am teaching you to observe, so that you may live to enter and occupy the land that the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. You must neither add anything to what I command you or take away anything from it, but keep the commandments of the Lord your God, with which I am charging you. You must observe them diligently, for this will show your wisdom and discernment to the peoples, who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and discerning people. For what other great nation has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is whenever we call to him? And what other great nation has statutes and ordinances as just as this entire law that I am setting before you today? But take care and watch yourselves closely, so as neither to forget the things that your eyes have seen, nor to let them slip from your mind all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. Here ends the first reading, the word of the Lord. We will read Psalm 15 responsively by whole verse. Lord, who may dwell in your tabernacle? Who may abide upon your holy hill? Those who read the blameless life and do what is right, who speak the truth from their heart. They do not slander with the tongue. They do no evil to their friends. They do not cast discredit upon a neighbor. They do not give their money in hope of gain, nor do they take bribes against the innocent. Those who do these things shall never be overthrown. The second reading is from James chapter 1, verses 17 through 27. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to the change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we may become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. For your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word, not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if there are any hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and on going away, immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unsustained by the word. The word of the Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. This is the gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus, they noticed that some of Jesus' disciples were eating with unclean hands, that is, without first ritually washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they don't eat anything from the market unless they also wash it well. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, 
the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked Jesus, Jesus, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but instead they eat with unwashed hands? Jesus said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you when he wrote, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. For you abandon the commandment of God and hold fast to your own human tradition. Then Jesus said to them, you sure have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to keep up what you make up. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever speaks evil of father or mother will surely die. But you say that if anyone tells father or mother, whatever support you might have had for me is Corban is an offering to God, then you no longer permit doing anything for a father or a mother in their old age, thus making void the word of God through your tradition that you have made up and handed on, and you do many things like this. Then Jesus called the crowd again and said to them, listen to me, every one of you, and understand. There is nothing outside of a person that can defile by going in. Food does not defile, but the things that come out from the heart of sin are what defile. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. So I'm going to let you all in on a little secret today, all right? And I'm going to tell you why this is going to be a really short sermon. This passage, I think, has nothing to do with us. Nothing to do with us, all right? Okay, so you better listen real closely because this is going to be real quick. Let me tell you what I mean. We'll see if you agree. This is a passage that is, that is about ritual purity. Ritual purity. And ritual purity is not something that, um, that we really think about very much or really even can understand. Um, ritual purity was this and is this whole category of the law from the Old Testament that has to do with approaching holiness, approaching God. And um, does anyone remember the story from the beginning of the book of Luke before Christmas where there's the priest, Zechariah, and his wife, what was his wife's name? Um, Zechariah and, uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth, yes. And Zechariah was a priest who was preparing to go into the holy of holies, but then um, as he was getting ready, um, God had promised him and Elizabeth that they would have a son, and um, uh, Zechariah didn't believe it, so God shut his mouth for 40 days until he, had, until he and Elizabeth had that son. Does that, does that ring any bells, that story? Okay, so the first part of that story is that Zechariah was preparing to go into the Holy of Holies. He was the priest who was assigned for that year to go into the most holy place in the temple, the, temp the place where they thought, you know, if God is anywhere in this wor world, God is definitely there. And to go into the, um, the presence of God is kind of a dangerous thing. So you have to make sure if you're going to go into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant is, like, you have to be fully as pure as possible. You have to be clean and cleansed from all that is worldly, all that can be defiling, all that's not godly. Now, what's really confusing about this is um, sometimes we hear the word unholy or unclean, and we think it means something that's sinful, right? Like, that's our association with something that's unholy or unclean, something that we do to someone else or ourselves that's just wrong, as if unholy sounds like it's something wrong. 
But in Scripture, this is what's so important for us to understand. In Scripture, um, unholy, like holy and unholy is one category, and then sinful and not sinful is a whole other category. Let me give you an example. So um, in Scripture, there are laws that say that uh, if you touch someone who, is, who has passed away, someone who has died, if you touch a dead body, to do that is to make yourself unclean. So you wouldn't, um, you wouldn't bury someone, you wouldn't touch someone's dead body, and then go directly from there to the temple. Right? Because to touch a dead body is to make yourself unclean, so you don't do that and go right to the temple. First, you have to wash and become clean again, become less, um, like, not defiled. To, to be able to uh, be in God's presence means you have to wash and become clean. But does Scripture imply then that touching a dead body is, is sinful? Like, does this mean that people shouldn't bury their dead? Does that make sense to us? No, I would agree. Kayla, that doesn't make sense. In fact, Scripture encourages us to, um, to bury our dead and to do all of, a, a lot of other things that are considered unclean. Like also, for example, touching blood, coming in contact with any bodily fluid, or even for women, the time of menstruation was a time of un uncleanliness. That doesn't make it sinful, right? It just means that when you've come, come into contact with a bodily fluid, you don't go right there from right there into the temple. It means you're not yet ready to approach God, to be in God's presence. Okay, so do you all get the difference between these two categories? We have holy and unholy, clean and unclean. And then we have also sinful versus morality, sinful versus not sinful. And they're not necessarily the same thing. Like there are all these things like touching a dead body, touching bodily fluids, even having sex that are not, that are not sinful, but they're considered unclean because they're not, um, they're not something you do on your way to the temple. You have to clean yourself, cleanse yourself. Okay, raise your hand if this makes sense. Okay, for the mo most of you, yes. Now, it doesn't fully make sense because it's not our culture, right? It's not our, it's not our religion. It's not our faith. So we don't use these categories very much. But whenever we read the Old Testament or anything referring to the Old Testament, we have to keep this in mind. That holy, just because something is unclean doesn't mean it's sinful. Okay, so this is a passage where Jesus and the Pharisees are debating about what uh, about these rules about holiness or unholiness, about cleanliness or uncleanliness. So um, when the Pharisees see the disciples uh, not washing their hands before they eat, we hear that and think, gross, wash your hands, please. Like every mother or father is a Pharisee in that way. They want their children to wash their hands. That's a good thing. Jesus is not talking about uh, cleanliness. Instead, Jesus and the Pharisees are having this debate over here in this corner about holiness and unholiness, cleanliness and uncleanliness. And the Pharisees have this to say. They want people, uh, Jews who want to be faithful, not only to be clean, but also to draw this kind of fence, this big fence around cleanliness to make sure that you don't accidentally slip up and become unclean and then wander into the temple. They want to make sure that you don't accidentally become unclean. So they have all of these extra traditions, you might say, all of these extra rules to help themselves and anyone who they thought wanted to be faithful to then um, to not accidentally become unclean. And one of these examples, one of these things that they encouraged people to do was to always ritually wash their hands before they ate. 
always ritually wash their pots and pans after they cooked, always ritually wash their food after it came from the market. And all these people were doing this anyway, but it was like the special wash washing. It was like maybe um, an example might be praying while you wash your hands or saying a verse from scripture while you scrub out the pot. It was this way of ensuring that you never accidentally became unclean. Okay, so um, I got a question for all of you by, by show of hands. How many of you have wrestled in the past two weeks with whether or not um, ritual cleanliness was something you really needed to worry about? Like, how many of you were burdened by ritual uncleanliness in the past two weeks? Any, any hands at, like, that just really struggle? No, no, like, that's why I said this passage is not about us. This is a, a conversation that Jesus and the Pharisees were happening uh, between Jews. Jesus was a Jew, the Pharisees also Jews. It was an intra-Jewish conversation. And so um, I'd like to say today, hey, it's not about us. So we don't have a piano player. I'm sorry, you also don't really get a sermon today. We're just gonna be done. Um, okay, no, I think there is something here for us. We just have to go a little bit deeper. We have to go a little bit deeper. I wanna read for you again, um, just a few verses from the end of this passage in Mark chapter seven. And um, Jesus then is going to give an example about some of the things we've been talking about. But he, you notice he kind of does a switch here. He kind of does a switch. In verse 9, he says, You sure do have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to hold on to your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother which is from the Ten Commandments, right? Honor thy father and thy mother, honor your father and mother, which is about taking care of them in their old age. But, but you say that if anyone tells father or mother, whatever support, whatever financial support you might have received in old age or housing support or food support, you know, all that support that I am obligated to give you that I'm obligated to take care of you, I'm actually gonna take all of that and give it to God. So I'm sorry, mom and dad, um, you're gonna to have to find your own way to survive in your old age because all of what I might have given you is Corbin, is an offering dedicated to God. This was something that they did, an offering, offering dedicated specifically to God that couldn't go to anything else. So Jesus says, then you no longer permit doing anything for a father or mother in their old age, thus making void the word of God through your traditions that you have handed on. And you do many things like this. Okay, so remember earlier we were talking about um, food, uh, uh, talking about cleanliness, holy, unholy. But then Jesus talks about honoring your father and your mother taking care of people who were vulnerable. Because remember, um, people didn't have 401ks back then. There, there were no retirement accounts, no HSAs. There was no way for someone who could no longer physically work to provide for themselves. So the only way that older people could be cared for was through their children, through the support of their children. And Jesus is saying, if you take the support that is supposed to go to your parents and you give it to something else, you dedicate it to something else, you've not done right by them. You're no longer honoring your father and your mother. Now, does this sound like a cleanliness issue or a moral issue? This sounds like a moral issue, right? So Jesus is taking the conversation from the, um, from the purity place and putting it into the morality place, into the faithful living place. And um, he's almost saying, like, 
You take all of these rules that, you, that might even be helpful to help you uh, stay clean, to stay pure, but then you do the same thing for morality rules, and it just doesn't, it doesn't help. It's no longer following the word of God. Then you no longer permit doing anything for father or mother, thus making void the word of God. The great challenge of passages like this are to read and hear that Jesus is having a conversation in a particular time, in a particular place, about things that don't really impact us that much. But then to see, okay, where do we find ourselves in this passage? And where I find myself in this passage today is that Jesus is actually encouraging us to go back to Scripture, not to rely simply on the fence that we might put around things or just to follow the things that we think are good, that we think are in Scripture, but actually to go back to Scripture itself. Because in Scripture, we find things that actually help us to take care of people actually help us to connect with God more than the fence of purity or impurity. In Scripture, we find new life. And I think we're challenged in this. I mean, how many of us have on a Sunday afternoon or something thought, you know, there's, I know that we're meant to honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. But I really want to finish that flooring in my bathroom. I know I've done that because the flooring's not done. I really want it to get done before the rest of the week. How many of us have thought, you know, if I just had that, the house or the boat or in, in scripture, it's the camel or the ox. We don't usually think of the camel or the ox, but how many of us have looked at our neighbor's things or our neighbors' lives and thought, you know, if I could just be more like them, then I might be happier, then I might be safer, then I might be more fulfilled. All these things are natural, and yet all these things are also in, in some way contrary to the Word of God. They're contrary to the law of God. And we're always going to mess up. We're always going to to sin. But when we just go away from Scripture, that's where I'm challenged by this today, to return to Scripture like Jesus is encouraging these people to do. Here's a final word of hope here. Jesus encourages them to return to Scripture, but even so doing, he gives them a word of hope. And the word of hope is simply what we truly believe. That we're going to mess up, that we're going to fail, and yet even when we fail, God's grace is for us. God loves us, and there is nothing in life or in death or beyond death that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, I really am going to sit down and finish this sermon. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for the gift of your word. We give you thanks for your law, which helps us to love one another and to love you. And we give you thanks for your grace when we fail. Guide us on our way, O oh God, and help us to be inspired by your word, to be challenged by your law, and to be comforted by your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit with me, and we will sing together the spirit song. We'll sing the spirit song.
Lift your hands in sweet surrender to his name. Oh, give him all your tears and sadness. Give him all your years of pain. And you'll enter into life in Jesus' name. Jesus, oh Jesus, come and fill your lambs. Jesus, oh Jesus, come and fill your Amen. Please be seated. Uh, I'd like to invite young folks. Kayla, would you like to do a time for young Christians today? Okay, we will skip today. I'd like to invite any of those today with um, a baptismal birthday in August or September, maybe also July. Okay, it's September, so July, August, or September um, to join me around the font um, the bap your baptismal birthday is the date in which you were baptized. Come on up, guys. This is okay. Just going to be able to see, too. In your baptism, Jesus saved you from your sin and death and received you into God's family. You were given new life and the promise that the Holy Spirit would be always with you to forgive you daily and to help your faith grow. As you have matured in the faith and an understanding of your baptism, I ask you, do you believe that through your baptism God has graciously forgiven your sins and welcomed you into God's family? Do you? I do. Do you believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit as we confess our faith in our creeds? Do you? The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you believe that as you remember your baptism day by day, by confessing your sins in Jesus' name and praying for God's direction in your life, God both forgives your sins and gives you strength through the Holy Spirit to be strengthened in your faith and your witness to God's love in Jesus Christ? Do you? I do. Do you intend to continue in this faith in which you have been baptized? I do, and I ask God's help each day. Let us pray. Gracious God, in your Son, Jesus' death and resurrection, you redeemed the world to yourself. In our baptism, you have claimed each of us as your own. Continue to walk with us, together and individually, that our faith might be daily reaffirmed by your grace. Through your Holy Spirit within us, make our lives to be a witness to your love and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord, listen to your children praying. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send us love, send us power. Send us grace. Let us pray. God of grace and God of love, we give thanks for your church in this place and across the world. Help your church here to be a place where your word flows with love and kindness, where we are encouraged to love each other and to love our neighbors, and where we are fed and nourished. Help your church, O oh God, to be all of this and more through your spirit and through your grace. Merciful God, receive our prayer. God of all creation, we give thanks for rivers and trees and for all of your creation. As the seasons turn towards fall, we give you thanks for new things in life, 
for a new school year, for moves and for new jobs, for new retirements. We pray, O oh God, for all those who are going through something new. Be with them and keep them and help them to feel your steadiness and to trust in you in all that is new. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Sovereign God, we pray for communities of every kind, for rural communities and urban communities, for established communities and new communities. We pray for all the countries and nations of the world, and we pray that we might be at peace with one another in this place and across the world. God, we pray today especially for those who are in danger, for refugees, for those who are poor or hungry, for those without clean water, for those in the path of war, for those who cannot escape. We pray today especially for those in Ukraine, for those in Palestine and Israel, for those in, the Sudan, in Sudan and Congo. God, bring peace and justice in every place. Merciful God, receive our prayer. God of healing, you draw near to all who are hurting in body, mind, or spirit. Be with all those who desire relief from chronic or acute illness, from cancer, or from post-traumatic stress disorder. We pray especially for those in our hearts, including those we name before you now. Tend to all these dear children, O oh God, the ones that we know and the ones that are known only to you. Merciful God, receive our prayer. God of comfort, console all who mourn this day. We give you thanks especially for the life of Brad, and we pray for the McKinstry family as they grieve his loss. We trust, O oh God, that New life is found in you, and we hold fast to the promise that death has been defeated by your Savior, Jesus Christ. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We entrust these and all our prayers to you, holy God, in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated as we offer our hearts and minds to God. from the coffers, hearts filled with care. God will not falter if we will dare, laid at the altar there. What have we to offer? What have we to bring? Love ripe with laughter, Hope that we can sing dreams of what we're after, promises of when laid at the altar then. What have we to offer? What have we to bring? Lies we exactly. Please rise. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, source of every gift of your creation. By these gifts and with our lives, help us to serve one another and all in need through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. 
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Give thanks to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. On the night in which our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. He broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat it. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took a cup. He gave thanks and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this cup and drink of it. For this is the cup of the new covenant, which is for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Come, for all are welcome and all is now ready. Please be seated. to the table of mercy, prepared with the wine and the bread. All who are hungry and thirsty, come and your souls will be fed. Come at the Lord's invitation, receive from his nail-scarred hand. Eat of the bread of salvation, Drink of the blood of the Lamb. Come to the table of mercy, prepared with the wine and the bread. All who are hungry and thirsty, come and your souls will be fed. Come at the Lord's invitation, receive from his nail-scarred hand. Eat of the bread of salvation, drink of the blood of the Lamb. Let us break bread together on our knees. Let us break bread together on our knees. When I fall on my knees, with my face to the rising sun, O oh Lord, have mercy on me. Let us drink wine together on our knees. Let us drink wine together on our knees. When I fall on my knees, with my face to the rising sun, O oh Lord, have mercy on me. Let us praise God together on our knees. Let us praise God together on our knees. When I fall on my knees, with my face to the rising sun, O oh Lord, have mercy on me. Let us break bread together on our knees. Let us break bread together on our knees. When I fall on my knees, with my face to the rising sun, O oh Lord, have mercy on me. Let us drink wine together on our knees. Let us drink wine together on our knees.
God, you have welcomed us to this meal and fed us with dignity at your table. Send us now to welcome others and to be at peace with one another through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. People of God, receive now this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and with mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to try this one more time. <laughs> so let's just say the piano is going to kick out halfway through, but you've been doing really good so far. So if I say it, maybe it won't come true. So here we go. <laughs> Go in peace, follow Jesus. Thanks be to God.